Okay, so a little while ago, I started a West Marches style D&D campaign, the first that I've ever tried. I have made many a mistake, many a blunder, and I am hoping that I can share these mistakes and blunders with you so that you don't make these same mistakes that I made when you start your own West Marches style campaign. Okay, so uh, what is a West Marsh style campaign? All right, there's a lot of history and blogs and authors and yada yada. Uh, but first, let's just go over what is regular D&D, or what has become regular D&D, which I'm going to refer to as New Age D&D, i.e. you have a DM, you've got four player, four-ish players, and you follow the story of these four players, and you pick up with their story at the beginning of each session, and you just follow these four characters, and then when their stories are done, the campaign is done. And now the alternative is sort of like old school D&D, uh, or what I like to refer to as how God intended D&D to be played. You take a big group of 40 players, a big pool of 40 players, and then for any given session, you pull round about four players from that for any session and then play your one session with them and then next session you pick a new group of four players from that pool and okay why am i specifically talking about the start of the session here because the start of the session is what i've come to find to be if any part of the session is ever awkward if any part is ever rocky and i find if any part is the most important of the session it is the beginning because i find once the ball starts to get rolling and players are starting to make decisions and play their characters and they start doing stuff i find that they just feel a lot more comfortable continuing to do more stuff until the session eventually reaches an end um, but yeah the the start can sometimes be very awkward and i'm trying to reduce i'm trying to like take precautions and create like a series of steps and things i can follow to ensure that the beginning is as minimally awkward as minimally aw uh, clumsy and just maximally just leading to something um, because, yeah, again, West March style, it's far more important that you get to the meat of the session as quickly as possible because you have to wrap up that session by the end. You, you cannot just, like, get halfway through an adventure and then just, like, call it there. So yeah, you just, you do not have time to waste on the beginning. And, okay. So what can you not do in a West Marches style? All right, well, you can't do what you would in a New Age D&D &D game, i.e., you know, play the easy mode. Uh, you know, New Age is, in fact, easy mode. You can just end any session and, you know, find the most natural cliffhanger you possibly can and sort of just force everyone to come back next time so that they can find out what happens after the cliffhanger uh, yeah you you do not have the easy mode option available to you in west march style you're gonna have to put some thought into it and create a whole new like unique start for every single session which can be a lot of work uh, so what what do you have to do in this west march style well for my campaign specifically I have any one given session cover no more than a week's worth of time. Uh, so because of that, uh, every player must be able to come to one single location to start the adventure, and they must be able to get with like meet up in the span of like roughly three days or so at like the maximum ideally everyone is just in the same starting location doesn't have to spend any time like meeting up uh, but if they do that's fine okay so how can you as a dm make this a lot easier on yourself 
well, by following this sort of super simple cheat code. Just have all your players be a part of one organization. Uh, now, so yeah, when, when your players are creating their characters, just have the single one requirement that for whatever reason, they are in this place and you know your starting location and they are a part of this organization some examples i threw out there noble court i'm currently playing in a game where i'm like a member of a noble court and that's been going pretty great we've always had a reason to all start in the same place and then just getting up to shenanigans and we all have a reason to be working together towards the, any given goal for any session uh, another good one uh, the classic is you are all members of an adventurer's guild in the current campaign that I am running, though, I decided to try to pull off some fancy pants shenanigans where I wanted all of my players to have their own organizations that they were members of. And I was hoping that at some point there would be like drama and conflict as they have different motivations that might intersect with each other. And I've come to realize that requires extremely proactive players to pull off in a interesting and meaningful way. And I am in no way blaming my players. I blame myself for trying to force them into the situation that I probably should have taken a look at their play style and their intended like course of action over any given session and quickly realized that that would probably not be a good fit for them but I tried to force it anyways and now I'm sort of paying the price and that now I have to come up with reasons as to why these different members of these different organizations are working together towards a single goal every single session which has been just way, way more, way more work than if I had just made them all members of just one Adventurous Guild. So that's one thing I would definitely recommend that you do for your campaign. Okay, so how does the original classic, uh, like how the West March's style in like old D&D and or how it was described by the blog guy that wrote it, how how do how does he like sort of structure and run his sort of West Marches style? So the general premise, the general idea, is that before any given session, like four or so players will uh, like talk to you, communicate with the DM that they want to work together. They have this thing in mind that they want to do. Either they have X dungeon. They at some point. Some player over the course of the campaign discovered Lizard Folk Temple, and they're telling you, hey, DM, we want to meet up on this day and go investigate and run through the Lizard Temple dungeon. Uh, alternatively, if they don't, if, you know, Lizard Folk Dungeon is not on their big map of West March style places of interest to explore, they might just go exploring and they might just run around their little hex map until they come across a dungeon and okay so this is how like a traditional west march style game would be run i have this is how i started off trying to run mine i have come across many problems with this style first of all it requires your players to with no input as you from the DM be willing to just go out there and either say like hey like let's run around and let's explore without any like necessarily uh, like strict incentive and or strict like uh, pushing of the DM for you to do that and or they need to tell you or you need to have players that are in a situation where they tell you like, okay, we're going to do the planning and the scheduling, and then we'll just tell you, the DM, what we want to do, and like, let's go do that. Uh, I have found that 
either through a combination of players not knowing what's available to them and or not wanting to restrict who else they could possibly play with I've just like ended up mostly just having to deal with a session of okay I know like there is going to be a like these players present but we aren't going to know what they want to do until they show up and start playing this session. And, okay, another thing about exploration is that, like, the traditional West Marches style requires lots and lots of DM preparation. You need to have, like, a dungeon prepared for if they decide to go to the north, if they decide to go to the south, the east, the west, you know, there, there needs to be something everywhere uh, for them to go and, like, do. And because this is, like, a West March exploration, everything is consistent between each four players throughout the entire vastness of your pool of 40. You can't pull off the sneaky, uh, like... Okay, well, I'll just have one dungeon ready, and then if they decide to go north, south, east, west, they will just happen to run into the goblin camp, and then they've all got their, you know, because I just had these four players, I was able to write a reason for why all four of these players want to go to the goblin camp. So it doesn't really matter how they end up there. All that matters is that they are going to end up there. But in the West Marches style, like, things are just in places, and then they are going to stay in that place. You know, you, you are going to have the Dragon Cave in the north, and they're going to walk up there and explore, and they're going to see it, and they are either going to decide, like, okay, guys, let's go into the Dragon Cave, and that is going to be our session for tonight. Or they're going to say, like, yeah, we're not ready for the Dragon Cave. Let's go south, see what's there. Oh, cool, Lizard Folk Temple. We are doing that for a session, you know, so you need to have lots of stuff prepared as the DM for the West Marches style, which can be tough, especially because now you might conceivably have like four or five dungeons, session adventures prepared that end up like not getting used if players decide to just not to ever pursue that sort of path. And I, yeah, I'm aware, like, okay, but you can always, you know, pick and pull stuff from adventures that don't end up getting used and just use them for other adventures. But now, if later on, you know, another group of level one adventurers and they decide to go uh, to this dungeon that no one else has uh, decided to go towards or to, like, explore and investigate and pursue, and then they run into encounters that you decided to pull from and use for another dungeon things can just get messy fast and i find it's generally inefficient and so another thing that you want to avoid with this that you can fall into is the sort of mmo experience of just players run do dungeon numbers increase and then they come back and like nothing has developed except for the fact that like some numbers have gone up. And now obviously th this is probably more of a derogatory explanation of this sort of style of playing than is really it's worthy of or not worthy of but that is uh, you know that, that it should be uh, like considered as such. Um... Also, this this is sort of like the the dream MMO, if you think about it. Like in World of Warcraft, you go and you do a dungeon, and then, you know, you, you realize very quickly that this whole dungeon experience and the whole video game is just like this meaningless, like, so I complete the dungeon, and then it just still exists, and then all the monsters come back, and then a million other people complete the dungeon. And you, you just realize, like... 
like why why does any of this matter like not nothing in the world is changing at least in this D D style dungeon completion uh like just escapade at least these dungeons are now being cleared and then they might evolve into something different or they might just now be empty uh, so at least you can feel like you're having an effect on the world and that like you're getting you can at least pretend you're getting something other than numbers on a page going up uh, but generally I want to err towards the like storytelling side of development rather than numbers going up side from my D&D campaign okay so like with this I, I ask myself, like, why why are we here? Why why are we playing this game? Like, uh, like, not to say that there's anything wrong with enjoying numbers and crunch. I think like, if you're playing D and D, that is going to be like fifty percent of the game, no matter how you run it. And I'm, I'm not talking about D and D as RPG here. I'm talking about specifically the game Dungeons and Dragons. Like that's going to be at least half a war game. There's going to be at least half, lots of numbers, lots of math. That's what like 90% of the space on your character is dedicated to. So the choice is really not between like 100% crunchy game and 100% uh, like narrative game. It's at a minimum just by playing D&D. going to be like 50% narrative and 50% crunchy or it's going to be no matter what a minimum of 50 percent crunchy and then the other 50 percent you can choose whether or not that's going to be narrative or if that's going to be crunchy and so uh generally why why i play the game why i am playing D D is for the storytelling aspect and there are multiple different versions of how stories come up and are told in D&D. So I've sort of got these in my order of like how much I care about this type of story being told in my game. Uh, so emergent narrative, this is the thing I truly, truly care about. My quickest example of like an emergent narrative is, you know, goblin bandit shows up and as a dm all i have prepared or all i have thought about for this goblin bandit is he's going to show up steal stuff from the party and you know maybe an encounter maybe they fight him and then like that that's about all i have in mind for that but when that goblin bandit shows up and he steals from the party and then the party reacts in such a way and that they say like like oh this goblin bandit like i i hate you and now this goblin bandit is running away and the party is swearing this bandit as their immortal their mortal rival their nemesis their mortal enemy and you know that that they have just like added a thing to the story they have added this whole element to the game like that that is what i play D D for is when we have each added an element to create like a full like all-encompassing story now like obviously what we've just written, written there is like the origin story the beginning of a story and then eventually that will turn into them encountering that goblin again and the story will develop and then that will continue to do so until at some point it reaches like a conclusion and it ends and is hopefully narratively satisfying but and everyone has known that like that is a thing that they had all put a piece of their character and a piece of themselves as a writer a little bit honestly and that they've all like worked together to tell a story in that capacity now obviously that is like the most super duper simple possible like emergent narrative type of storytelling that is possible in D&D &D. Uh, but yeah that that feeling like that that is why I DM that that is why I play D&D &D in general as a DM or as a player like that I if a uh, like a soldier like when he's in the trenches 
and he's like getting shelled or whatever and you know like a let he opens up like a letter and it's like from his daughter and he's like crying as he reads it and he like realizes like oh my god like this is what i'm fighting for like i almost lost hope i almost forgot but like this is why i'm here and this is why i'm doing what i'm doing you know i <laughs> well obviously this is a meme hyperbolic situation but that's uh how i like similar sort of feeling is what i get is this from a dm or as a player it's just like when these moments occur where everyone is adding elements and pieces of characters personalities and backstories and parts of the world are all coming together and everyone is adding parts to come up with a story that we are all starting to write like those are the moments that I like play D and D for. Like those, if that feeling could be like distilled into a drug, I would overdose and die on it because like I just love that feeling so much, and I want to do everything I can to like curate an environment where that can happen as often and as naturally and as meaningfully as possible and okay uh so an, an important part so this is my number one this is what i think is the most important part of a DD game now technically a character with no backstory and no personality could just come into an existence from nowhere and just existing as a stat block and they will become an interesting and meaningful character given enough opportunities for like emergent narrative to like shape them as a person uh bar that you need a story like th this is the ideal story but if you don't have that you need a story even if this is just a story that we have written down and this is a story that is already in our heads you like every single character at a minimum you need their beginning their middle and their end and the end you need to like this character needs to have come from somewhere like they need to have a start their like status quo that they began as and then they need to be working on something and that is them playing the game that is them taking part in these sessions they're the middle of their story and they need to be working towards an end like a conclusion where they imagine their character is going to end up their goals their desires everything like and uh you know the player might have their own idea as to what this beginning middle end is a dm might have a completely separate idea as to what a character's beginning middle and end is and then what ends up actually occurring over the course of the campaign and the game might be totally totally different from those other you know what you had in mind is that beginning middle and end it might be something totally different but what's important is that the player and the dm both have anything in mind for a character's beginning middle and end no matter how simple or complex it is otherwise you just have numbers on a page and a stat block and that's all what your character is which uh, yeah, like that's it, it, like if you, all you have is a stat block and then emergent narrative never comes to exist and never manifest over the course of the game then you, you just have nothing you guys are just filling out excel sheets and occasionally rolling dice and that is really what we want to avoid and okay the plot the overarching story this is you know so this might be oh there's big bad evil guy and there's a king and he has a son and the prince and he's being deposed and there's a civil war and all this stuff is happening in the world and you know uh, so like the world might be ending if, if this big bad evil guy sees his whole plan through and there's MacGuffins and all that other good stuff. Uh, like, that's all neat and cool to have. Uh, but it is no, by no means, like, what you need to have in order to have, like, a meaningful campaign. Uh, because, really, the only things that exist, the only thing that is the story that makes up the campaign 
is what your players actively have before them. Whatever they are interacting with and whatever they care about is what the story becomes. Uh, so the plot, so if they never interact with this overarching plot, if they never interact and if they don't care about what's happening in your grand plot, then it doesn't exist. It, you are writing head canon fan fiction for your own setting, which fun and cool. Um, but like you you need to understand that you are writing that for yourself and you like it, it's you're not writing it for your players. Your, your players do not care. Your players just care about whatever they care about. Now, if that happens to line up, if they do happen to care about the plot and then, like, interact with it, then, you know, that's that's great. That's how you can tell, like, a true, like, not not just a, a like, character analysis, like a, you know, like a character story, but that's how you can really tell a great, you know, Lord of the Rings epic, but that's really not what, like... D and D, especially not what a West Marches style is about, and another argument might make like okay, so I, like I, I can just make the plot matter because I know it is going to be going on in the background, and big bad evil guy, he's going to take over this town, and that's going to stop this supplier from making his green herbs and now the prices of potions are going to go up double and now when the players are going to buy potions like like it or not the the plot has interacted with them and uh, even if your players go to the potion shop and they buy potions they find out they're more expensive and even if they ask so wait, why why are these potions are more expensive? Like what happened? And then even if the potion seller explains, oh this that and the other thing, and big bad evil guy, and all this other stuff is going down. If the players don't care about it, and if they don't interact with it, it continues to not matter. And like it it only existed as set dressing in those moments that you were explaining it. And then after that, it just became nothingness. It went back to being head canon fan fiction. Uh, so yeah, overall, don't don't care about plot. It's it's about the characters. But everyone already knows that. Okay, the round table. All right. So this is the term I am using to explain. You know, we're we're getting back to the starting of the West Marches style session. Like, how am I physically picking up? Where are the players? Like, what is happening? So the round table can be a couple of things. Generally, it might be the tavern, you know, where, okay, we're all meeting up at the tavern, and or if they're part of an organization, maybe they're meeting up at their guild hall, or if they are the members of a council, they're meeting up at their council table. This is where everyone is starting. This is... Uh, you know, you, you're just like dropping them in, back in the world and you're saying like, okay guys, you are here, like what do you guys want to discuss? What do you guys want to do? And so this works well if the players know what they want to do, i.e. if they have discovered a dungeon last session, they're like, okay, we know we want to explore that dungeon, or if they have just completed level two of a dungeon last session they're like okay we know we want to go out and complete level three of that dungeon then this is a great and fine way to start a session uh otherwise if they don't actively have that goal and or thing they want to pursue in mind this i find leads to that clumsiness and awkwardness that we want to avoid because now you're basically waiting for players to just to say like okay well let's do this thing let's go exploring and you're going to have to rely on having a minimum of at least one proactive player who's willing to take that leadership position and then everyone else is going to have to work with them and if you like and if that doesn't occur and if no one takes that position then you, there's going to be a long, long, awkward pause as everyone at the table is waiting for another person at the table to 
say something and start something. So my way around this is if you go with the round table approach and they do not actively know what they want to do, then do not waste time letting them run around and figure out the hook. Don't wait for them to have to leave the tavern and then explore and then go to a forest and then eventually have them run into a gnome who tells them that he needs help with defeating a bugbear. You know, just have the gnome show up at the tavern right at the beginning, have him talk to the players and just straight up tell them, like, hey, I need help defeating this bugbear. You know, that is going to be contrived and it's going to be unnatural, but I can guarantee you contrivedness and unnaturalness in the story is way, way better than having 30 minutes of, like, silent uh, nothingness and or, like, just, like, meaningless discussion. And, okay, so this is not... 100% directly related to the round table, but this often can come up in this round table uh, part of a session, I like the beginning, which is what I call like the planning stage. Now the planning stage as a DM, uh, it it is kind of like a crutch I find in that I've played with some truly, truly great DMs that have fallen back on this. I I think this is extremely, like, easy to fall into, even for, like, truly experienced DMs. And it is, like, a very insidious, like, very deceptively harmful to a game. Uh, So how this usually goes down is players have an idea of a thing they want to pursue, they know, like, okay, so we're gonna go take on this bugbear camp, and then the players are going to argue about, okay, let's go in through the front, no, let's go in through the back, let's go in at night, let's go in at day, and, okay, when this thing happens, when these guards see us, we're going to react in a way by throwing smoke bombs here, and then when we go in, and then the archers over here, we're gonna have the fighter run over here to deal with them, and then the cleric over here is gonna run off, and he's gonna help deal with the spellcaster, and then and then the rest of the party argues, no, 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 no. Let's have the cleric go over here, and then he can deal with the wild wargs, and then and you fall into this thing where, like, an hour can be spent just planning and arguing and discussing how to handle this upcoming situation. And both as a DM and a player, sometimes as a player... I'm just like so excited for this opportunity to actually have other people engaging in role play, like talking about what's going on in the game, that I just want to keep it going and keep discussing things and just talking about more ways that we can uh, like see through this plan. And as a DM, when this happens, I'm so glad that role play is finally occurring between my players and they're actively discussing with each other what to do that I am like more than glad to just sit back and relax and let it all like happen and unfold before me the problem with planning is that it's so so often just meaningless the plans just fall apart like within you know you might spend an hour setting up these plans and discussing and arguing and having ideas as how to tackle different situations and then 15 minutes into trying to enact the plan some unforeseen situation occurs or arises and causes the entirety of that plan to fall apart and causes the entirety of that one hour discussion and argument to just become worthless and meaningless And so I've used like a little bit of a uh, shooter game, like competitive shooter game sort of analogy, terminology. Uh, Like in those shooter games, you either have like meaningful impact kills where these are kills that actively win you win you the round. And then you have stat padding kills and you just like you're getting a kill and you're increasing your KD ratio. Your number is going up, but 
you didn't actively help your team. You, you just increased a number. You didn't win the round because of that kill. You just got a kill. So this is basically like baiting as a DM, if you will. It's letting the rest of your team go up ahead in front of you. And you're causing this role play that has no effect on the future and this role play that does not take things from the past into consideration and the the stuff you want from role play is generally not the SWAT team table and or like heist planning table where everyone is talking not from the perspective of their character but talking from the perspective of a like an operative trying to complete a mission and they're not talking about elements of the world they're not talking about elements of their personality their backstory they're not developing anything there is nothing emotional there is nothing dramatic happening there is like ju just logistics and uh, and you know, like there's it's logistics that even then just doesn't even like most of the time that doesn't even end up mattering so planning try to keep it brief uh there, there's a great game the uh, blades in the dark that is a heist role-playing game that is designed to uh, uh instead of like planning for an hour and then trying to use this plan to go through with your heist you just start on the mission you just start doing your thing and then you use flashbacks to to like describe the planning that has gone in before this so i think if you want an idea as to like how to solve this planning stage issue i would recommend looking into blades in the dark okay so the hook all right so you so the, I've, I've broken this down into like three general hooks the let's go to the dungeon uh and by dungeon i don't necessarily mean a dark dank stone pit in the ground with rooms with orcs in them i am using the most loose definition of dungeon like you, you could imagine like just a series of like more than three encounters be them social combat or like intelligence based like just three or more encounters that are in some way connected uh but so but in the past like I, i've been using like you know lizard folk temple or whatever you know if, if they know we've got the dungeon let's go to that and or uh, you know, we've already completed the previous levels, but let's go complete the next level of the dungeon. This is the most straightforward, the most efficient, but the least interesting. Okay, so an event. This is slightly more interesting uh, because at least you're bringing in an element of the world, the setting, and but it's slightly less efficient because there's going to be more opportunities for things to go wrong from the stages of going from the hook into this leading into the players dealing with encounters and conflicts. So what are some examples of events? Okay, there might be a festival in town and or they might there might be a prisoner execution, a hanging, there might be a marriage, there might be a natural disaster like a meteor shower or something. Okay, and the third possible hook is like the personal hook the like a player has a player character has a thing going on that that has some element of like conflict to it that needs to be like completed or solved to some degree uh and this one is definitely the most interesting because this one directly cares about like this is a direct thing that the player character cares about and like directly involves them but this one has the most that can go wrong for all the from hook to the dungeon and okay so these one two three steps are mostly important for the event or the 
personal hook. Uh, so there's a situation. So this is just given to the players. Don't have your players have to find out about the festival. Just plainly, directly tell them that you guys are at the festival. Like that is where we are picking up with this session is that this festival is occurring. Okay, and then there needs to be an antagonist. Now an antagonist, not necessarily bad guy or monster, not even like enemy or opponent of the party. All that, like, the, the bare minimum for something to count as an antagonist, by my, like, definition in this usage of, like, my hook uh, formula, is you need, an, like, a, an entity with a motivation and or a goal that does not align with the players. And, okay, so they need to, or they desire, so there's some other entity that wants to take advantage of whatever this situation is whether or not it's a personal situation or like a global event or like a town event or whatever a regional event maybe i should say okay so this might be orcs come up to the festival and want to use the festival as an opportunity to you know mess things up or maybe the meteor fell and they're going to go over to it to harvest it for metal or there's an execution happening and then these orcs are going to show up to stop the execution uh, well whatever the event is so there's an event and now if an event just exists and this part doesn't happen uh, then the event becomes meaningless the event becomes set dressing if there is just a festival and nothing is happening with that festival is if there's no like conflict being generated by the festival and if the festival only exists so that players if they want to run around and play a carnival game then they have that opportunity uh but at that point the festival exists as much as just a piece of scenery as a wooden chair is sitting in a corner exists and that if the player wants to take that chair with them or if the player wants to sit in that chair then they have that option available to them you know so like if you want the festival to not just be a chair in the corner of the room it has to have an element of conflict attached to it and this thing you should also let your players know about they, they should not have to go to the festival and then have for some reason think that they have to do investigating and sleuthing to find out that there's something going on with the festival like if you are relying on them to be proactive in that manner then there's the opportunity for nothing to happen and that for the the game to come to a halt which again is what we want to avoid ever happening and so okay so there's got to be antagonists and there's got to be a conflict involved with situation and then these antagonists have to in some way lead to a nearby dungeon and or a nearby series of encounters now if you do want like an investigatory clue based element to your adventure this is where i would introduce it like the the festival should just be known by the players there there shouldn't be any hiding that there is a festival going on just put the players there and then the orcs messing with the festival should just be like obvious the players should know that that is happening they should not have to find that out and then if now that the players have a jumping off point now that they know to ask people about like hey so what's going on with these orcs and this festival at least they have a place to start from at least they have like so something to work off of and then they you can do a, a little bit of a detective work element for them to have to figure out like okay so where are these orcs hanging out and or like what's this situation like what's the deal with these orcs are they meeting with someone else and like 
why, like why why is this happening and or like but what can we do to solve it like what and or what what will happen to us if we don't solve it what are the stakes on on our part um uh, you know so if they want to like work to discover any like if you want them to force them to like work to discover an element as to like how these how how this situation and the conflict revolving this around this situation will lead to them going to a series of encounters uh you know this is where i would uh you know include that uh, otherwise you can just have this known if, if just some gnome walks up, up to them and says like hey these orcs have messed with our festival and if you go to this orc camp and get back at them like we'll give you a prize for doing that uh okay so yeah you need if you don't have a dungeon that they are actively working on or that they actively want to go to you need a hook okay the personal vignette so with this i'm just going into a little bit more detail about how to make the personal hook work as opposed to like the event hook uh, so the personal vignette the like a little bit of story for any one given character to kick off the session so if the, if you are creating a hook that is going to motivate a player towards a specific goal this should be a goal that the entire party can take part in and profit from if you start off the session with dwarf characters brother ghost showing up and giving him a sword and telling him hey you need to kill the trolls that killed our family and you know earn our vengeance and give them what's coming to them you know don't do that if you don't actively plan on that player and the whole group to go after these trolls this very session because by starting off the session with, with that your implication very much so is like hey you've got every reason to go down and like track these trolls if you do want to do something along those lines and like give this character another sort of story element vignette to work off of uh, but you don't want them to actively pursue it in that very moment you know introduce it in the middle or at the end of the session and okay so another thing that's really important and or it comes uh you know that uh, comes up a lot in a west march style is downtime because there's always like time between each session if like every session is always like a week apart then they always have like a week that they can be doing stuff towards so players will constantly be doing downtime um now I, i've kind of made the mistake of like asking players what they want to do no one really knows exactly what what they should be doing so they ask for examples so i give them the like list of downtimes they can perform um, and then that becomes what they think their options are. You know, they, they think that this has become like a menu that they have to like choose from rather more so than just like some examples of things that we can make with the ingredients that are available to us. Uh, so my sort of method for getting around this is... Uh, creating like custom downtimes that uh, you know because so far a problem that you might run into if playing 5e and using xanathar's guide and all that is that um you're gonna end up with a gladiatorial school as every single player does nothing but pit fighting every single week because that's like the thing that just makes everyone the most money the most consistently at the minimal cost um, so what you really want to do, or I ideally, is if you, like, want to, f like, make a character do something, like, cause them to interact with this situation, that you're still letting them keep their agency, uh, and they're still the ones making the choice, uh, you know, may okay, okay, so let me start off with some examples. 
like a dwarf character. Maybe he has a father that has just died, and he's got like a funeral that he has the option to go to. And the benefit for going to this funeral is going to count as his downtime. He's going to have to take three days to travel there and then partake in the funeral procession or whatever, and then three days back. So this is going to be his downtime. But what's the benefit? Why would he do this over just pit fighting and making 100 gold? Well, this might have a chance for him to, uh, like, uh, you know, be present at his the will reading of his father. So there might be a chance for him to make some even extra money and or possibly get like a magic item or something from his family, like an heirloom. Alternatively, like a uh, like a member of maybe some like theatrical troupe or something might be invited to like pay, tar- take part in a show that will, you know, net them more gold if they play for it than if they just did pit fighting. And now there's, you know, you've, you've just created situation. Now antagonists can, uh, can create a conflict as they interact with that situation. And now the players want, uh, have just, like, a hook has been created as these players now want to get back at these antagonists that have in some way wronged their, in some way created conflict during their situation. And, you know, so now they're going to pursue the dungeon, the series of encounters to get back at these antagonists. Um, So how, so, so, okay. So making this more worthwhile than pit fighting to create that sort of, like, illusion of choice. You know, you, you have to give an incentive to make this more worthwhile and combine this alongside making this only available for a short period of time. Like, you can only go to your father's funeral this week and or you can only play in the show, like, this week. Like, this is not going to be an option that is available next week. Next week, you can do all the pit fighting you want. But this week, you, you've got this funeral as an opportunity and if you want to take it, then you've got these benefits that might even be better than pit fighting for you. And if not, you've always got the choice. You can just choose to continue to do pit fighting. Uh, and now I, with these two elements combined, it's almost certain that they're going to pick this personal customized downtime than they would pick that uh, you know generic downtime. And you know, so so like player agency has. Uh, remained as they still have this choice and I know you might be thinking like okay but if this thing is just like strictly better than this other option then are they ever are they actually even really making a choice uh and to that I say you know ooh la la Mr. Philosophy Major like go back to watching the Matrix or whatever and then come back when you realize no one's ever really made any choice ever, and free will is an illusion and doesn't exist. Uh, okay. So, la conclusion. Ha, 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 ha. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the session, if they feel directionless, if, if there is a thing, if people are being silent and awkward, just have things happen. Have the hook show up and occur and give them something to do. And if they just, like, do not care about whatever is going on, just keep coming up with new stuff and just keep introducing new elements until there is something that they do care about. And then just, you know, riff off of that, have abuse that for as much as you can, get as much out of that as you possibly can until they stop caring about it, and then add something new until there's something else that they care about. Um, And also, player agency is everything. Do not have players be uh, brought places. You know, players must go to places. Players must do things of their own accord, not because they are being forced to. 
if anything, unless you like actively want to like punish your players, like like if your player died and like went unconscious and or like did something really dumb or stupid, and you're like, okay, I, I want to make sure that they feel the consequence of their actions, then you can force them to be brought to a place. But otherwise, don't have your players get captured and or knock them all unconscious through some on on uh you know something that they couldn't avoid some unavoidable thing and then force them to end up in a dungeon in a series of encounters to deal with because when you do that you've just taken away player agency which you really really want to avoid doing uh, but you know that's just a little bonus tip i guess uh but yeah just uh you know as long as everyone's having fun that's really what matters tell a good story and i don't know just throw in boblin the goblin or whatever everyone on reddit seems to love that guy all right goodbye